Okay, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you for attending this morning's webinar for the West Coast. Um, we've been doing these webinars since the pandemic hit starting in April as a way to connect with the nanomedicine community. This will be our last webinar um, because of the uh, the holidays approaching. So um, it's only fitting that we brought in a guest speaker, um, Dr. Francesca Terabelli. She comes to us from Houston, Texas at the Houston Methodist Research Institute, where she is director of the Center for Muscular Skeletal Regeneration. Um, just before she begins, I wanted to go over um, as a reminder, your team in North America, the West Coast team, um, of course, we have Angel Garlaza, which is who is our regional sales director in the uh, Bay Area. And Ian Villamagna is his field application scientist. They work in tandem together. I'm Kim Killian, uh, the Regional Sales Manager for the Southwest located in San Diego. And I work with um, Viet Nguyen, who is the Field Application Scientist, um, also located in Southern California. I guess that's everything for now. We're, um, again, we're thrilled to have um, Francesca join us. And um, we look forward to seeing you after the holidays uh, as well. We'll resume the webinars. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you to the uh, Precision Nano System to invite me to give this uh, seminar. I'm sorry for the spooky introduction uh, uh, slide. It's just to celebrate in our way, in, in, our, in our nerd way, Halloween that is approaching. And also because I will talk a, a lot about masking. Um, I will start to say something that probably all the audience knows about nanomedicine. So our idea of nanomedicine is uh, uh, present, is being presented by Asimov as the first uh, to create this tiny machine. They are so smart that they can travel around the bloodstream and they eventually can reach the final target time uh, site and destroy or treat. And this target site can be any kind of disease. And this is kind of a sci-fi idea that we all have in mind. Probably most of you use these slides in your presentation just to explain what is nanomedicine, what's the aim of nanomedicine. But the what I call a semi-untold story that se it seems pretty easy, but is actually kind of complicated because this is a good review that is just went out. There is a lot of barrier, a barrier that actually um, uh, prevent our nano machine to arrive to the site that they want to target. And there are different barriers, starting from what is called MPS or mononuclear phagocyte uh, system, which are our cell, uh, white blood cells that are meant to catch our nano machine and chew them and remove to the bloodstream so they we cannot reach the right target, as well as the endothelial barrier, there is more a physical barrier in which we have to try to trespass. And when we go out from the endothelial barrier, we have an extracellular barrier. So it's like this dense matrix, especially when we talk about tumor, these fibrotic caps that actually prevent our machine to arrive to the uh, cell target. And then once, even if we, if we uh, arrive at the cell target, we have some barrier, cellular barrier, like the membrane or the endos endosomial barrier that can prevent whatever we put in our uh, nano machine to explain their work. So how we do this? We actually uh, like this quote, from uh, Pablo Picasso, the artist. They say that the good artists can copy and the great artists steal. So we actually want to get inspiration and steal from nature and understand how normally in the human body, uh, this barrier can be penetrated. And some very efficient uh, uh, objects that do this are leukocytes. 
leukocytes basically can go and uh, go around the uh, bloodstream very easily. They can reach the site, especially some site of inflammation. They can extravasate, basically, so they can pass the endothelial barrier and can reach the target. So, as I said before, we want to understand and study what nature does, and normally nature does the thing in the better way, and try to steal from it. Uh, the concept in order to overcome this kind of challenging. Uh, doing this, so we study the white blood cells and, and like in the guess who game, we try to understand what kind of players we can play with and we exclude eosinophil and we exclude neutrophil and B cells and also T cells and what it remains is actually monocytes. Monocytes are our target cells and basically what we to try to do and what we actually were able to do is get the face out of the monocytes and use it to mask our nanoparticles. And uh, we did uh, some years ago with this uh, work uh, uh, authored by uh, Manis and the first author was Roberto Molinaro in which we uh, use the membrane of cells and especially leukocytes we rip it off the, the face, as uh, we use as a metaphor, and we use uh, as a, an integral part of our synthesis. So one of our reagents is actually uh, membrane proteins, and we came out with the liposomal formulation. The good thing, and how easy it seems uh, uh, like um, uh, this idea, it was a little bit challenging for the chemistry point of view, but we managed actually to uh, fabricate and synthesize these particles. And these particles are liposomal particles. The size is 120 and the PDI was pretty stable. We characterized them for their uh, mechanical features. And uh, also we check the protein, if the protein were functional. And uh, the protein were not even functional, but they also maintain the glycosylation we also demonstrate uh, in the advanced material paper that uh, computationally, uh, the protein that we integrate are facing the right side of the particles. Basically, they are not internalized in the internal core of the liposome, but they're exposed to the external part. And this is very important. We are actually ongoing to demonstrate also empirically and not only computationally, but it's kind of challenge, uh, challenging right now. However, our hypothesis is that, okay, now we are able to build these particles. Let's see if the particles retain the function of the leukocytes. And we demonstrate with intravital microscope and we, you can see here that basically in comparison to the, our control with our, the same liposome, with the same uh, uh, liposomal um, uh, formulation without the proteins, they enrich and they target way highly the, the leukosome. And not only, we know that leukocytes basically interact with the endothelial uh, um, through LFA1. So to understand a little bit the mechanism of targeting, we actually use in the intravital microscope some uh, uh, antibody anti, uh, against these uh, ligands. And uh, we saw that the targeting was reduced. So this is, doesn't mean that the targeting it, is only uh, related to LFA1 and CD45, but at the same time, this is the first approach in which we try to explain the mechanism underneath this highly targeting. Uh, Moreover, the fact that I was telling before that the fact that these particles, they are using a mask, basically, they are not recognized as bare particles from the MPS. And in fact, they remain way longer in the circulation. As you can see here, this is the liposome formulation, while this is the leucosome formulation with the same inject number of particles. You can see that there is an increase of a circulation time of almost 10 times after one hour injection. And this is means that uh, basically the MPS don't recognize this nano object as foreign object. And uh, 
sorry, I come back one second on this point, the fact that they stay more in circulation, I don't even to explain to this audience, it means that they are more possibility to reach the target in more efficient way in comparison to the control liposome. So now that we tailor and we are able to get this mask, the next step is what we can do further. We, can we do a better mask? Can we do a more efficient mask or, or can we tune the mask itself? So this is a work that now is uh, under revision for RCS Nano. It's carried on by uh, my amazing student, uh, the postdoc, Dr. Asaf Zinger and Manuel Sushinita. And we start to play with these ingredients, basically, uh, the um, phospholipid as well as the proteins. And what we try to uh, assume is that if we increase the amount of proteins that we embedded in the structure, we actually enhance this targetability. And uh, uh, we will come back later of how difficult it is from uh, uh, the uh, point of view of the formulation itself. But what I want to show is that uh, when we increase from 1 to 100, which is the normal li uh, lipoprotein uh, ratio, to 1 to 20, so we, uh, we use five times the concentration of protein, we retain the same ability and the same size and the same polydispersity of the, uh, of the particles, as well as uh, we increase, of course, the zeta potential because we introduce a lot of uh, more protein on the surface of our particles. And we prove that the, 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 the proteins that we are interested, the, the proteins that actually man help or at least we think that the help to maintain their uh, uh, physiological role are actually increased on the surface of our uh, particles as well. Then we want to try to understand if in vivo these uh, particles work better. And we try on two different uh, types of uh, inflammation. One inflammation that is induced by LPS and is a local inflammation, and one a different kind of inflammation because we always think about inflammation as a, a, a only one thing, but actually inflammation are different type of inflammation. And we are very focused on this, how this different type of inflammation actually can be targeted and how is the biodistribution of our particles depending on the inflammation. So for what pertain the local inflammation by LPS, we developed this method in which uh, is pretty easy is technical, very, very uh, robust. We inject LPS in one of the ear of the mice so we can have the internal control. So the control lateral uh, here is not inflamed and we can monitor by IVS, but also intravital microscope. But the good thing about this model that doesn't need exposure, but we can place the uh, uh, live mice directly uh, under intravital microscope. And we can see that actually with the, this formulation, which is in, uh, rich in protein, we actually achieve a better targeting. And when we go in a more difficult uh, animal model, which is triple, ne uh, triple negative breast cancer, is more on the application itself. So triple negative breast cancer has the problem that doesn't have a target. So target therapy is very difficult because there's not a target. But as a many cancer, the inflammatory part is in, uh, inside uh, the, the, the cancer development. So what we want to target is the tumor targeting the inflammation itself. And we develop this method and we inject the particles. And also in this, uh, in this model, we confirm that the uh, composition of 1 to 20, so when we reach five times the, uh, the protein concentration, we actually achieve a better uh, uh, targeting of the site. So now we have this tool. So as I say before, inflammation is, is really different, but it's also involving many, many disease. So we can really go everywhere with this, uh, inflammatory, uh, with this inflammatory target uh, um, tool. The problem is that if we want to move forward, and this is what is my main message of this uh, talk is how we move forward with this complex nano platform. We have to choose one application, also because uh, 
um, as is believed before, this platform can be basically loaded with everything and can be translated in with everything we want. Is actually this is didn't come uh, 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 very nice. So some drug cannot be loaded in the leucosome in the normal formulation, but we have to tune the formulation depending on the final application. So we have to choose a direction. Uh, I'm part of the uh, orthopedics and sports medicine department, so my first interest is what related to musculoskeletal disease. So right now I choose one um, example, which is a cancer of uh, the musculoskeletal system, but we have uh, many other collaboration either with cardiovascular people, neuro, uh, neuro people, and uh, other applications are instead on trauma and, uh, and different trauma on the, and arthritis in general. So I will speak about osteosarcoma. Why I want to speak about osteosarcoma and why I'm, a, I, I'm like a fan of osteosarcoma, first of all, because it's one of the oldest type of cancer. It's recently this year has been discovered in a dinosaurs a, an, a case of osteosarcoma that actually is the first case of cancer in the world. And still, no matter if, we, if the human beings are fighting with this cancer since millions of years, we still have the 70% rate, um, the, the 70 rate of survival. It's a pediatric cancer. So there is a lot of uh, uh, challenging from what pertains uh, side effect toxicity because we have to administer drugs to kids. And uh, uh, there's not molecular uh, targets uh, as well as the triple breast negative cancer. And especially in, um, in our case, an, um, uh, another challenge is that is in the bone. So when we spoke about barriers, and the extracellular matrix barrier, we are in the bone in this case. And this is what I want to, I like about this, uh, this project because it was a, a big challenge for what pertains nanomedicine and why. First of all, because uh, uh, our clinical counterpart, which is Dr. Houston for Baylor um, School of Medicine, came out by a screening to use this molecule, which is called ponatinib. Ponatinib is a drug which is FDA approved for some uh, leukemia. Is a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and actually seems to work pretty good in a, in a preclinical model. Unfortunately, for some of the application it was uh, meant to be, it was had a, a black box by FDA for side effects. So it's kind of toxic in the for the vascular system. And so a nano approach can reduce the side effect of this drug. So it can be a very easy way to translation uh, the drug directly uh, to the um, uh, to the bedside. The second thing that actually as a uh, nanotechnologist uh, uh, challenged me the most is that, uh, as I say, as I mentioned before, the target, uh, the first primary, primary um, site of development is in, within the bone. So the barriers are way different than in other solid tumors. And secondarily, with the same tumor, actually the first metastatic uh, site our lungs. So with the same model of the same cancer, we basically have a complete two different environments. So we have with one particle has to face the two different environments. And uh, so we start uh, our journey to, the, to try to up, uh, approach uh, a nanotherapy for uh, osteosarcoma with the leucosome. And the first challenge was the leucosome was not working because ponatinib has a very low solubility. Very so, low solubility that we try to take, tackle with uh, using BSA. Uh, we want to use BSA, but remember that we deal with proteins. So uh, BSA uh, can be used and we managed to use, and we just published this paper uh, recently, a couple of months ago, uh, because finally we uh, formulate the deponatidim in nanoparticles, not only in um, leucosome, but also in liposome, and uh, using BSA as coadjuvant, and uh, actually help a lot in the solubility and the encapsulation of ponatinib inside our particles. 
we demonstrate that it's not toxic on uh, um, and it can be encapsulated in the, the, the can be the, we describe a little bit the trafficking of these particles within three different lines of osteosarcoma. These are Murino osteosarcoma cell line. The three different cell lines are different kind. They are differently aggressive. Some are metastatic, some not. We study we study the pharmacokinetics of this leuco lipo uh, ponatinib in order to understand if the, to the, par the particles were toxic by themselves or they are, the toxicity were induced by the uh, loaded drug. And now we are moving in a more uh, um, challenging time because uh, again, this is uh, what we want to try to tackle is the trafficking is if we can reach and uh, with these particles, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tumor stroma, uh, we try with sarcosphere uh, mostly uh, at the beginning, especially this is the work of uh, Federica. And um, we create, and actually we are one of the first people that uh, developed these 3D models, which is uh, another uh, tool of our lab, 3D model of uh, sarcosphere. Uh, the 3D model is very useful, first of all, because it gives us first the three-dimensionality of the tumor that is lost in the 2D. We can study the penetration of the particles within the tumors, and most likely we can uh, also address the problem of cancer stem cells, which is a big problem. And this is what uh, brings recurrency and uh, metastasis in osteosarcoma. As you can see, uh, different cell lines, some cell lines uh, cannot uh, form uh, sarcosphere. Some other can, but also they are different because, uh, as I say before, as I mentioned before, these are different cell lines with different level of uh, um, aggressiveness. And you can see that, uh, well, you not you cannot see uh, literally. You have to you have to trust me that leucosome actually penetrate uh, better than liposome within the core of the sarcosphere. How they do that, we don't know yet. We may, we probably we have preliminary results that tell us that there might be the interaction with the ICAM. Of course, adhesion protein uh, when we go in this 3D environment are uh, highly expressed in comparison to the 2D. So this is also uh, uh, why we move on a 3D, even if it's a little bit more challenging for the technical point of view. Uh, we are not stopping uh, on the um, uh, mouse model, but we went to PDX and we form a um, sarcosphere for PDX and we treat with, uh, um, with these particles. For sure, when we pass from a mouse model to a human model, we change the source of the uh, cells. Uh, we don't have yet proof that this is actually... Um, uh, required for our system, but we want to, since that we want to be as much translation as possible, we, uh, we move from J774 to uh, THP1 as a source of cells. And you can see here that also we reach a point in which the, the particle it itself has uh, some toxicity somehow, but when they are loaded with ponatinib, they are way more toxic. And then we, um, we went in vivo. So uh, this is a work of uh, Dr. Stefania Lenn. And also here you can see that basically when we go to a primary tumor, so who, for who was not familiar, the primary tumor of osteosarcoma, we basically inject cells intratibial. Uh, so it's a kind of challenge, uh, challenging uh, uh, model because uh, is, as you can see even here from the picture, I can I I wanted to show the picture to show also why we have this variability because the um, the graft of the of the cell are induce different kind of uh, growing. So we try to normalize and standardize as much as possible the model, but there's still a lot of variability of how the tumor. Uh, grow inside the bone, as well as uh, we cannot normalize for this, the, the tumor size, what we do for other kind of solid tumor, uh, but most likely, or most likely because we, uh, we explant the whole uh, uh, leg and uh, basically we cannot wait because sometimes the, ex uh, the, uh, the explant of the leg doesn't contain the same amount of uh, 
uh, bone itself because we might cut the acetabular part. And so we cannot really normalize by the size of the tumor. If you know a method, please let me know because we are struggled because of that. And that's why we have a lot of uh, repetition, I can, as you can see here. We go by high number in order to reduce the standard deviation. However, we can see that both of the particles, remember that, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mention, we call also our liposomal formulation as biomimetic because we use the same phospholipid that there are in the, no, in the regular cell membrane. And as I mentioned before, as a nanomedicine, one of the challenges, like at the beginning, I was like, I don't know if, it, if we'll ever reach the bone tumor. And actually, I was very surprised, and, and my collaborator as well, that they were going in the bone. Um, there's not too much study of osteosarcoma. Actually, there are none uh, in intratibial uh, uh, model. Most of them are uh, just... Um, uh, subcutaneous. So I, I was, I have to, I have to swear, I was very skeptical that we can reach the site. But I, I was impressed about we can reach the site for both of the particles. Um, but then, as I mentioned before, one of the problem of the osteosarcoma is not really the 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 primary. I mean, the primary can be if we want to save the limb, but the second part is really connected to the uh, lungs. And um, again, with this audience, we might know that lungs are uh, easily targeted by some size of particles, and uh, we are way below the, the, the size of the particles that normally target the tumor because we, are, again, this, this kind of platform is around 120, 150 nano, nanometers. So when we move to the lungs mat, you can see here, this is just a very preliminary work because we just started that. But I am I want to mention because that the, the difference here that we can see, oh, sorry. The difference here uh, that we see is that uh, Leuco seems to target a little uh, bit more than uh, lipo liposome. What I want to stress more instead is the biodistribution of this organ because uh, when we have this induced lung, lung mats uh, model, you can see that the liver uh, and the sp uh, spleen are uptake a lot of liposome while the leucosome is way less uh, uptake by the filtrant organ. So especially in the model of mats, of lung mats, we have uh, a more higher circulation of the leucosome. So um, right now we have significant difference between the two particles, but again, it's with three uh, mice only. I'm not uh, so keen to say, oh, okay, we solved the problem. And um, so this is just an example. Again, we have many examples ongoing that we did before with the uh, uh, Roberto other type of uh, uh, cancer with different formulation. For this particular formulation, we are stick on osteosarcoma, but not only eventually. Um, we have other application with uh, different formulation that include genetic cargo. Uh, I want to um, tackle this part because uh, it was a really challenge as me as scientist uh, working in the nanomedicine for a while because of the different tumor microenvironment that we want to target. But just now, uh, yes? Before you move on, uh, just sure. a quick question about the, um, the route of application of these particles. Um, for this work, I uh, have a question whether it's uh, an IV uh, application, uh, IV injection? The... Is IV injection, yes. Thank you. All our treatment are IV injection, and we really never try to do uh, uh, intraperitoneally. Uh, I have to say, though, for the efficacy, especially for this uh, particular application, we are struggling a little bit because ponatinib itself, as FDA approved, is um, OP, uh, so is orally administrated. And uh, so right now that we are working on the efficacy, we are actually working of how compare an IV injection to in comparison to the OP injection. But we are on work. I don't want to spoil too much. Thank you. Um, what I want to stress a little bit uh, with this presentation is uh, 
how can we move further? Because uh, I know, and I know most of the audience struggle at the same uh, way as I do, that we do a lot, the production of papers about nanomedicine are so many, but actually this transla uh, translation to from the what is called from the bench to the bedside is very low for uh, many, many reasons. Most of the reason are uh, due to regulation, uh, but uh, most others are that uh, the, the uh, uh, formulation are not, uh, whenever they pass even from one experimentator to another, they completely don't work. So that's why I'm, uh, uh, as a translational scientist, I'm uh, very focused on understanding the reproducibility of the platform. As you can see in the paper that I signed before in the Ponatimi, we have four operators and we show in the paper four operators and how the four operators actually are able and in, in independent uh, synthesis that uh, they can achieve the same result of the particles. The, as I say, uh, translational scientists, because uh, uh, most of you probably don't know the Houston Methodist Research Institute, the uh, good thing of us is that uh, is a um, research institute inside the hospital. So this is uh, help us, first of all, to realize what is the real clinical need. But at the same time, we have uh, a, a GMP facility inside the hospital. So I'm, uh, I'm trained as a GMP operator. as you can see here this person over here. You, it, it can be basically everybody, but it's me. I promise. Um, so this thing let you let you synthesize or even plan your synthesis with the final aim of is this translation is translational platform or not? It's just very fine and robust science, but it will never see a bad side. And with this platform, with, which I just introduced, which is kind of challenging because there are a lot of steps to follow up, is where we want to go. We want to move forward. We want our, my aim, particularly, and the people that work for me is moving forward and one, uh, maybe in the future, reach the bedside of some of the patients. So what are the, the challenges? Actually, the challenges are a lot. Because uh, uh, and right now I can say that we are here, we are in the preclinical and we are trying to move in mid-scale production. But I want to go a little bit uh, uh, in details of what are our challenging and what we try to solve. So if we dissect the synthesis in steps, we, and I will focus on ABC basically, we have cells. So we have all the problems that are related to just translate a cell uh, protocols. We have an extraction protocol and we have a synthesis protocols. So for what pertains the cells, of course, you can think that uh, when we treat the cells, we use if for in vitro experiment, we don't use too many cells. And uh, um, and this is the work of uh, Federica Giordano, as well as the cells that we use are very plastic cells. And with very plastic cells, I mean, they are picky, depending of, on what they grow, on where they grow, they assume different phenotype. And we don't want change because we know that the information that they trigger, they trigger when they are not polarized. So we are pretty sure that all the data that we that I show you before and what we published, we didn't polarize the macrophages, but we know for sure that these cells are very plastic and whatever you use, and even if you change the operator, unless you standardize very well the method, they can change. And if they change, they change your, your platform change as well. So, and uh, this we we basically prove on our uh, uh, skin many times. One time, just to let you know, we normally uh, used to grow them in adhesion, so on the Petri dish, normally the big Petri dish. But what happened is that uh, when we grow in the Petri dish, we change the Petri dish, so we use another plastic, and they were inflamed. So, and this is a cell line. These are not even primary. This is a cell line. So they, they change so frequently. And of course, if we envision a production, 
So we envision that we have to um, extract many, many proteins from these cells. We have to go, and this is where we are now, on a rolling button. So to create, to, to grow these cells and amplify these cells uh, by the protocol, but in this way, the cells are no more, they are not growing anymore in addition, but rather grow in a suspension. So is this change something on the phenotype? Is change something for the activity of uh, our cells? And this is what we are trying uh, to understand right now and to standardize the protocols in order to achieve expansion without losing the, the, um, the information that basically the membrane protein uh, bring to us. We all, of course have validation, interma, internal validation of the state of the cell. So apart the, the infection of uh, mycoplasm and endotoxin and so on and so forth, we have also uh, tried to characterize as monocyte and not going to macrophages itself. So we, uh, between flow um, and uh, RT-PCR, we actually try to understand if these cells are not neither uh, inducing M1 or M2 phenotype in order to don't hypercomplicate the system, as well as uh, when we go to the membrane extraction protein. So I mentioned a little bit before that uh, when uh, I was speaking about uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, extra the, the amount of protein that I can introduce in the platform are limited and are limited for a reason. So we describe what kind of proteins we have in the, in the cell. We did the um, proteomic analysis in the natural materials. We, we showed that we have an enrichment of membrane proteins with our, uh, our method. The method is this extraction of membrane protein is a commercial kit. And um, the problem is that when we retrieve from the commercial kit our protein extract, so we are here, they are in a buffer. And what we show is actually that when we increase the quantity of the protein, we increase also the buffer. And this is affect actually the, the size and the distribution of the particle itself. So we have a limit that we cannot overcome that is due to the fact, first of all, that we don't know what there is in the buffer and also about the quantity of the buffer that we want to introduce in our synthesis. So, so this, the only way around this limitation, it was to create our own method of extraction of protein. And this is the direction in which we are going. So this is the normal extraction step that it happens of the cell membrane. So we go by an extraction buffer one that permeate the cells and uh, an extraction buffer two that actually lies at the cell and give us our membrane protein. This is a work of Riccardo Rampado. And uh, what we try to understand if it's, first of all, for economical reason, we cannot rely to a kit because a uh, kit has some limitation and it's kind of expensive. So we want, and, but we are organic chemists. So we want to understand is an extraction method, we can deal with it. This was my point with Riccardo. I think we can achieve a way. So we uh, try this uh, new um, method that we developed, which we call NEXT. Uh, which is a different uh, kind of reagent. And uh, we compare with the kit. And uh, we saw that pretty much we have the same kind of trend of extraction. In some, uh, in some case, we, uh, we can have uh, the similar result as well as the kit for what I can call yield of protein. And also we extract pretty much the same protein. So in this case, uh, we are uh, following CD11B, but we did also proteomic. We are waiting for the final results, uh, but, and we check the purity, so the, the real enrichment. So with this new method, we actually uh, have a lower enrich, so a lowest purity. We still have some proteins uh, that comes from different department, but uh, at least we obtain the same protein that we are interested in and they give to our leucosome their, uh, their efficacy, as well as 
we translate to a THP1, that is our human counterpart. So this is with, uh, with our cell source, which is J774 for the murine. And we also try to understand if uh, for THP1, it was the same. THP1 are smaller uh, cells. This is just to let you understand the translatability of the, uh, the system. Every time we, uh, we introduce a variable, even um, a variation of type of cell, doesn't mean that we obtain the same thing. THP1 are very smaller, so we have to adjust the method of extraction depending on the cell. Uh, the, the good thing of this method uh, in comparison to the kit is that costs, I will say, 100 times less. Uh, is uh, there is only one reagent has to be done at the very uh, before the uh, the extraction method. All the others are buffer that can be stored off the shelves, basically. So we are pretty happy about this part because also we can produce tons of this uh, uh, reagent without relying on a, on on a kit. Francesca, uh, just yes. before you, you you move forward, we have a question about. Um, since you're, you're talking about the extraction of these proteins, um, how do you, you know, control the ratio of these proteins on the surface of the liposomes? Do you adjust it or do you, yeah? If you could so it depends on the formulation. Basically we introduce, uh, uh, we uh, normally speak about a ratio between the lipid part that we introduce and the protein that we introduce. We always relate on the uh, mass of this uh, protein in comparison to the mass of the lipid. That's why we call it lipid protein ratio. So we calculate the quantity of protein with BCA kit to understand how much protein we introduce in our solution. So we uh, mainly introduce on, in the liquid uh, phase. Great, and, and then just to follow up on that, uh, so for those, um, which means that the, the ratios of the various types of proteins that you have are really just based on the what you extract from the 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 the, 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 the cells from the cells. Yes. Okay. Yes, but not only. We uh, demonstrated years ago that of course, if you have a method to overexpress a protein. You know, we always start from uh, cells and cells can be conditioning in some way in vitro. So we can eventually enhance the, uh, the, the membrane protein in the cells. And then we saw that we can transport this enhancement on the particle itself. Thank you. So having said that, how we... Uh, scale up the synthesis. And here we are our friend uh, of precision nanosystem. Uh, right now, um, some of the data, not all the formulation that they showed today are being uh, done with the um, nano assembler. Uh, the one in which we tune the concentration of protein was done with nano assembler. Ponatinib cannot be done with nano assembler. We try hardly, but unfortunately, since there's a lot of sticky protein, it becomes challenging to have, uh, because we messed up all the chip of every time. So we went for an, um, a normal uh, um, TLE method. So it depends. The scale up, uh, we are going, depending on the application, we are going in one direction or another. We have the other application, which we use the nano assembler. And we really think that uh, the scalability can go by nano assembler by far in comparison to a TLE for the ponatinib uh, um, application instead we envision. And we are actually scale up uh, right now. And this is the work of Asaf and April. Uh, we are trying to scale up uh, um, as much as possible uh, the platform. Right now, we are trying to synthesize 10 milliliter of uh, the particles in one batch. Finger crossed. <laughs> uh, but the other question is that is actually the question that all the people ask. How stable are these particles? How is the storage of these particles? If you really want to translate them, how much stable, how, how long, how can be the process all, all over? So this is a challenge also for the preclinical study. So we 
previous data say that, uh, and for sure, everybody that works in liposomal formulation know that they are not the, the super stable, they are not polymeric, they are not super stable particles. So uh, for a preclinical study, we kept in a four degree and uh, we were able to use for a um, decent amount of time. I will show you the, uh, the data later, but my uh, aim is like, can I freeze them? Can I really store them? So we, um, we did a big step. We stored the uh, membrane protein right now that we actually did batch by batch by batch by batch of protein storage. And those are pretty, um, pretty stable. So we can store that part. But uh, we, they, we develop actually um, also a method to store the particle itself. And we try with uh, sucrose. And uh, because if we store in PBS, so for sure, everybody knows that uh, with the, as you can see here, the particles are not stable, stable at all when we tow them. But when instead we use the, the sucrose during the dialysis or before the dialysis and we freeze them, they become pretty stable. And this is uh, a good light out of the tunnel to say, okay, there might be a method to store these particles. As well as, as I was saying before, um, how they are stable at four degree. Well, they are stable at four degree. This is still in the same um, uh, uh, work that I was mentioned before. They are pretty stable. We kept them at four degree for 21 days, and uh, we check the pres. Uh, I mean, we check the physical chemical characteristic of this particle, as well as uh, uh, their. Uh, let's say biological feature and we saw actually that they maintain the same profile now they are functional or not we are on the on on the way because everybody knows that they might be over there they might be not fragmented but if they are folding in a different way they might not exert the same uh, um, features and this is what we are trying to do right now try to do to store them and then re-injecting and see if we can see the same level of targeting so i'm done almost i want to just uh, give a, a little bit of take-home message so the take-home message of this presentation is the locosome is a, is a good proof of concept a platform that can be tuned for a specific application but needs to be tuned for specific application Highly target inflammatory based disease. We try in many, many type of cancer. I show you the uh, osteosarcoma, which is one of the most challenging. We try with osteoarthritis and it's, it's pretty consistent. Of course, as I said before, it have to be tuned uh, depending on the encapsulation because sometimes the old formulation is not good for some kind of drug. And uh, it might be, I don't want to be so optimistic, but I have uh, at least my, uh, my trigger forces that I want to bring in the, on the bad side. So it can be uh, translated as a potential to be translated in the clinical practice. Now, there is a lot of pitfalls that can happen. And uh, the, the question that we have to do to ourselves uh, is, how we reach the bad side. I show you that we are going to that direction, but there are a lot of barriers also here. So there are a lot of limitations and we need to know what are the limitations. Otherwise we'll not get achieved. And it's important, especially for uh, us that we are in this preclinical state that we know what are the limitations to translate this platform uh, on um, in clinical practice. So what are the next steps, what do we have to focus on? And uh, that is very important, especially for a so broad application that we try to have a final application in order to come out with the product. And uh, because as I say before, depending on the final application, depending the formulation and so on and so forth, so, and the requirement of the formulation itself. And the final is, I will say the last but not least, the funding, uh, when you are in this average uh, uh, moment in which you are from the preclinical, you want to move to clinical, it's very difficult to find funding that uh, sponsor this part. And so the part of uh, optimization, the standardization, and um, I hope that I can get uh, some of them in the future. With this, I want to thank all the amazing people that work on this 
platform before, but uh, especially the people of my lab. Uh, and uh, here are the people basic that I they that show their work right uh, in this presentation. Here are other members of my lab. I want to thank, of course, the uh, the funding agency of my work, the CIPRIT, the Kleber Foundation, and the Department of Defense. And of course, I want to thank you for your attention and your interest. And here are my eventually my contact. Thank you very much, Francesca. It was a really great, uh, great presentation. We really appreciate it. Yes, um, I just wanted to say grazie, Francesca, for the beautiful <laughs> presentation and for agreeing to be our guest speaker. Um, we will, as I said, this is our last webinar, but we will continue our journal clubs through the end of the year. So everybody just have a safe holiday season. Please join us at the, with the journal clubs if you can. And um, we'll speak, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you Bye.